Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Russell. I work in the search group here uh, over in Building 43. And it's my extreme pleasure to introduce to you our guest for this morning. Um, I actually first met Nadine at a panel in Austin, Texas, where we were accidentally sat next to each other. And in the conversation, that was a panel about online education for, for children. And it was such a fascinating conversation. We've been in touch ever since, and that was about a year ago. Uh, Nadine is, uh, as you saw in the abstract, the vice president for Sesame Street Productions. And she has this really interesting background in educating the world and educating kids in particular. So among other things, uh, she's been the executive producer for uh, Sesame Street in Bangladesh and India, right? which uh, uh, since she's from South Africa, she really has much more of a global view than I do. <laughs> so that's, I think, a fascinating thing. She's also done a lot of work in helping kids, uh, in particular, understand the impact of HIV AIDS on their world and on relationships and love and so on. And uh, I think you produced, a, a, or directed, I'm not sure which is, uh, Shushu, Shao Shao? Cha Cha. Chao Cha, yeah. I'm sure there's a click in there I'm not getting. But uh, uh, in South Africa, a, a fantastic series that was done on relationships and how to best think about these things and, and understand them. So let me introduce to you Nadine Zilstra from Sesame Street. Good morning. I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here. And particularly after I saw those colored bikes, I'm like in love with Google. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's colored bikes. This is awesome. Um, so, so pleased to be here with you guys today. Um, I thought I might start by just reframing some of the things that I, we at Sesame kind of know about who we are. And we always presume everybody else around us knows those things too, but some of those, those foundations people might not know. So I thought I'd just kind of re just frame us quickly. Um, Sesame Workshop is a not-for-profit organization. And I think, you know, some, sometimes people can forget that there's all these products out there that are, you know, kids running around with Elmo plush, but those products actually help us support the work that we're doing in many, many countries around the world. And I think our not-for-profit status is one of the things that really helps us stay focused on our core mission, which is to help children reach their highest potential and you know our audience and this is another thing that's interesting about our our brand is we really are able to span this incredible range of people that we have fans you know crazy muppet wiki people who know me because i'm a director on the show nobody else knows that um and then you know kids obviously and then grown-ups and grandparents and i think it's one of the things that helps us really stay relevant and stay connected to our audience. Um, one of the things that I find so surprising is one of our most successful apparel lines is the one that's for 11 year olds, which is kind of, you're like, wow, that's interesting. Um, so our promise is to educate as preschoolers with our recipe for success, uh, which is using the power of media and the magic of our characters to around an educational curriculum. And I think this is really the heart of what, what drives everything we do. That we have an educational curriculum that guides each of our content choices along the, the road to producing content. And you know, while that, that curriculum was developed 44 years ago, it is absolutely in flux. At every year, we are coming back to it and saying, what are the needs of children now? How can we address those needs? How have those needs shifted in the last year? And I think it really does help us stay true to trying to be educationally effective and have impact. Um, while our, we've, we're kind of at the end of a two-year curriculum cycle that was focused on science, technology, engineering, and math. So two years ago, we had a very dynamic um, educational seminar. And at our seminars, just so that you have a sense, we have everything from educators to academics to teachers to artists. And I think it really is important as we kind of go into those seminars to be listening for different voices and how to, f how to hear from different kinds of people about what the specific needs of children today are. Uh, so we had the science, technology, engineering, and math um, 
curriculum seminar and it was really opened up a very exciting direction for us that our goal was not to teach each of those as independent disciplines but to see them as a, a joined set of set of curriculum so in this whole se season that we were trying to teach stem we wouldn't have one segment that was just about science or one segment that was just about engineering we were really trying to pull those pieces together which was a huge challenge for our writers um, so that was in the first year that we did the curriculum and then in the second year what we found was that for preschoolers, the arts presents a really exciting lens through which to teach STEM. So kids are you know, naturally inquisitive and their, their exploration is so much about arts and crafts or about dance or about music. And you can use those as an opportunity to teach science, technology, engineering and math. And that has really opened a very exciting couple, year of content for us that we just premiered in February. And I'm going to kind of break down for you some of the process that went into producing some of that work. Um, so we use this model, which is thinking about the needs of a country and addressing it in media with our Muppets all over the world. And the educational needs we address in different parts of the world are different. The characters we use to speak to those needs are different. And it really is powerful once you start thinking about the, the potential you have to address HIV AIDS in South Africa, but to get, address girls' education in India, or you know, the, in Kosovo, we have a huge curriculum that's all about mutual respect and understanding. And it does, I think our model leaves us open to being very in tune to what the kids in a specific part of the world might need. Um, so one of the big things that that's also changed in the way we think about the work we do is we started as a TV show and we of course had very powerful outreach and we're working with teachers and communities right from the beginning but over time we've started to see the power of not only just the TV show but the TV show and our digital landscape and the and kids in their classrooms and we really see our educational framework as feeding a very broad content e ecosystem and so in all of our thinking now we're thinking we're not just thinking about how do we make a tv show we're thinking about how do the messages of the tv show connect with the digital pieces connect with the mobile pieces you know really looking at that ecosystem as it, in its broadest sense um, so forgive the kind of uh, 70s Venn diagram because it is actually one of the original images that we've used to describe our model. And you know, the workshop basically is comprised of three different groups. We have a content team and, and the content team is the team that are looking at the production and what we're making, whether it's games or video or whatever it is, and finding ways to make that more educationally salient and relevant. And then there's a research team that's taking that work and testing it and saying, well, we tried this with kids and this worked, but this didn't. And it's a really interesting, I mean, sometimes a little volatile uh, Venn diagram. There's a lot of debate that goes into, you know, I think this is the best entertain, you know, most entertaining, you know, piece of comedy. And the, the educators are like, well, but the kids aren't getting it. And, you know, it's a very volatile back and forth, but I think it's in that passion for wanting to do the right thing to educate kids that some of the magic of Sesame lives in that dynamism. Um, so I have a little video to just kind of we want to speak to our model. The children's television workshop is an experiment. Research is woven into the total fabric of the show. Every segment is being tested and evaluated by the toughest critics of all, the children themselves. Thirteen. Thirteen. Fourteen. The job is helping children reach their highest potential. Super brother! We're always looking to identify what are the critical educational needs of children. Let's hear you sing the alphabet. A, B, C. One example is we have a literacy crisis that our country has been facing for a while. We've worked with the military on a whole series of shows dedicated to those families and those families' needs. We're in over 150 countries internationally. 
Programs focus on girls' education, specific health initiatives to mutual respect and understanding. The needs of children are constantly changing. The show is always evolving. That's one of the main reasons why we're still around 40 some odd years later. Today, we are launching the Educate to Innovate campaign, a nationwide effort to help reach the goal this administration has set, moving to the top in science and math education in the next decade. I remember reading the Times and going, we have to teach this. I mean, we're so far behind. Sesame Street has a new mission this season to help American children catch up with the rest of the world in math and science. One of the first things that we do in an initiative is bring a bunch of experts around the table and really hear from them how to best address this issue with children. If they learn a very simple cognitive skill set that right. we've been talking right. about, they gain a measure of control. When we enter a country internationally, what's really key to our success is that we're working with local partners. Once we get informed by uh, these content advisors, we revise the curriculum and then we start creating content. Now with our STEM curriculum, we know that children learn through failures. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, all sort of in one discipline. Well, like, okay, this is a subject we don't know about. Like, how are we supposed to teach it to a three-year-old? I, I know my letter Q. That's easy. It's a story. But it's really, it's problem solving is what we found out. I just had my hair done, and now I can't get down from here. You see, I'm a cow, and cows can't walk downstairs. With Supergrova 2.0, we are actually modeling the processes of STEM but we're also giving children the language of these concepts. Oh, I think you just made a ramp, Super Grover. So what's a ramp? It's working. What's a lever? What's a pulley? We're trying to understand what children know before they're exposed to our content. Can you tell me what a hypothesis is? That's a tricky one. Say like Super Grover. We ask them a whole bunch of questions about particular topics, and then we'll show them some content that addresses that particular subject. How will we ever get this? heavy piano up to our nest. And what we try to do is make sure that the educational message is embedded in what's funny. <laughs> then after they watch, we want to see what they learn from the content. And how did he get it up? The pulley. That's STEM education for a preschool audience. We did it! We don't just say we're an educational company that makes educational media, we prove it. There are more studies on Sesame Street than any other television show. And for the 40 plus years that we've been around, lots of academic researchers have been focusing on what we're, what we're doing here, but we don't rest on those laurels. We make sure that with each new initiative that we're delivering on what we're promising. We know in our hearts that that's working, but it's also really nice to have evidence from the academic community that, that's really showing an effect. <laughs> no other program works as hard as we do to make sure that its content is relevant to the lives of children. It, it, it's all right. It's entertaining to these children. This stop sign is an octagon. <laughs> we found but as they're entertained, they're learning. And that's what one of our founders, Joan Gans Cooney, wanted from the very beginning. Um, so, it's, you know, that video does actually a great job of kind of sharing the process and how we do it. Um, but I just wanted to take a minute to echo some of the, so this is kind of the journey our piece, our content moves through. You can see there's that deciding what we're going to, you know, what direction we're going to go in. And then this curriculum seminar that we've spoken about. And then the production piece, which is, you know, very dynamic and ongoing. And then we haven't spoken much about the formative research part. So we will not dive into producing something new without really taking a minute to say, how did kids learn from that? Did they, le did they learn the things we wanted them to learn? And how can we change what we're teaching, wh the way we present that information to make the learning more salient? So a really good example is part of our STEM esteem initiative was a new format that we were making with Elmo called Elmo the Musical. And it was Elmo using music and performance to teach math lessons. 
And there was a big piece of it that was about, you know, Elmo imagines his world. And there was a whole lot of, and it was the, out of the curriculum seminar. And it's really amazing the gems that your creative team kind of hang on to. So we were at this curriculum seminar and I was sitting next to, behind Joey Mazzarino, who's the head writer who you saw there. And um, the, the academics were just talking about, you know, what the needs were and how we needed to address them. And it just kind of in passing, one of the women said, you know, there is something so powerful about the phrase, what if? And then she kind of moved on. And I was standing right behind Joey and I saw him just write, what if? And like, okay, that's kind of cool. What if's a cool thing to hold on to? And then two weeks later, we got the script back and he had taken that gem of the what if and created a whole opportunity with it that Elmo, every time Elmo starts an adventure, he, sit, he stands and he says, what if, what if, what if? And that's how he imagines his world. And so that what if moment became really important for us because it was a, a way to really model for kids if you're going to try and imagine how do you do that and what language can you, you use to try and inspire your own imagination. Um, and we had a visual effect and it was really funny actually, the internal debate with how do you visualize imagination? And all the writers were like, well, you can't, like you just imagine and then it pops into your head. So it needs to be a pop. And so we're like, okay, we're like, okay, let's work with that pop. And so we made something that was kind of like a pop and we tested it with the kids and they didn't get it at all. They were like, what is this thing? Is it fireworks or like, how, what's popping? Like they totally didn't understand what we were trying to teach at all. And so in the end, and, and it's so wonderful to create space in your production world to, 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 to look at that, to kind of step back and say, are we doing what we think we want to do? Um, so in the end, we totally reworked the imagination effect so that he has these kind of objects that swirl around his head and then one of those objects becomes big and that's how he imagines. But um, it was a really great ex a way to remember the power of that formative research and making some space for it. So with our STEAM initiative, I thought I would just take you through one of the scripts we just developed and it's actually going to air next week. Um, just as a way to illustrate how the content evolves through the production process. So we were, um, one of the writers had this idea to do this awesome script that's all about Oscar hosting a trash giving day parade. And of course, Oscar's trash giving day parade can't be bright and sunny, it's got to be grouchy, it's got to, you know, the music's got to sound bad, the, the colors have to be gray, you know, it has to be a grouchy trash giving day. Um, so he wrote this script that was truly an awesome script and, and there were kind of three beats. The one was um, uh, the marching band, the other one was a big float and the third one was a big floating balloon. And in each of those, in his first script, in each of those events, like each of those beats, he found a different way to solve the problem. And when we, our advisors and our, our educators looked at the script, they were like, well, look, if there was one consistent thing that he was using to solve each of these problems, you would, you would have a much more compelling message. And what, one of the ones that he had been thinking about already was solving a problem with water. And water is a whole unit of study for preschoolers. And so the educators were like, let's jump on that water idea. Why doesn't he use water to solve each of his problems. And as in doing that, suddenly we were really able to explore the properties of water and the, you know, some really great properties of matter issues that might in another context have been quite difficult to teach. But through, through the context of the arts and STEM, suddenly these things felt much more accessible and available. So this particular script went through five different iterations. The first one was the one where all the three things were different. The second one was once we honed into water working for all three of them. And through the, the, the third, fourth and fifth, we were just continuously crafting that message. And I, what, what I love about our work and our process is there's never a point when anyone says, okay, yeah, that's good enough. Like things are always like, oh, but if we just did this a little bit better, maybe they'd learn a bit more. If we just did this, maybe that message would pop a little bit more. Um, so I have a clip 
that's from that video, which I just thought was fun to, for you guys to see how, how it ended up. Music. What's wrong? They sound amazing! That's just what's wrong! This is a grouch parade! They're supposed to sound terrible! I just hope Mr. Disgracefully didn't hear that. Oscar! 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 What is that I hear? Melody? Rhythm? This is supposed to be a grouch band! Am I gonna have to fire you? No, 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 of course not, Mr. Disgraceful. <laughs> I got this all in the crawl, all in the crawl. Huh? Well, make yeah. sure that you do. Yeah. Because nothing. Then I mean nothing had better do anything but rain on my parade. Yeah, okay, now you heard the grouch. Play it again, and this time, make it sound awful. No, 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 no. No, stop the music. You sound too good. Oh, what can I do to make this band sound terrible? I have an idea. What, what? <laughs> Water. Water? Water cleans. Water refreshes. No grouch problem can be solved with water. Well, maybe this one can. Oh, yeah? Well, how can water help a marching band sound terrible? Well, when you blow into a horn, the sound travels through the air in the horn, and it sounds good, right? So? So, the sound will move differently through water, and I'm pretty sure it'll sound horrible. Oh, well, what are we supposed to do, genius? Fill the whole street up with water? Uh, no, but we can fill the horns up with water. Huh. Terrible idea, but it's all I got. What are you waiting for, Chris? Fill those horns with water. Okay, let's get some water for this trumpet. That's good. Uh, and some more for this horn here. Uh -huh. And some water for the tuba. Excellent. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> all right, all right. Grouch Band, play something. <laughs> Great idea, Chris. I was just trying to help. Those ah! would sound terrible. And they wet people. Impressive work, Oscar, my boy. Impressive work. Thanks, Mr. Disgracey. Thanks. I aim to annoy Mr. Disgracey. <laughs> Anyway, so he goes on to really have a pretty grouchy parade. At each turn, the water just makes things worse and worse and worse. Um, so I thought it was help maybe helpful to take a minute to just share with you guys some of our thinking about how, how we use the broader ecos content ecosystem to try and push one particular educational goal or focus. And I'm pleased to see our San Bruno friends over there because they're a huge part of us helping to make this all work. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, our sh when we package our show, we're really conscious of the pieces we put together. So the street story might be one piece where, and, and, uh, and it's a really important part of how we are able to shape our educational message. But we also have a whole lot of short form pieces that work around it. So pieces that went in support of this particular clip. We had a word on the street, that, the word on the street was inflate because the kind of climax of the story was Oscar trying to make the balloon float when of course you on a grouch parade you can't have a balloon floating. So there was a lot of work, they were really using the word inflate, so inflate became our word on the street. And we had Don Cheadle doing a whole little small insert piece that was all about the w word inflate. Um, we also combined it with um, a really awesome Super Grover piece that was all about the, also all about water and the properties of matter. There was, you know, he was trying to move to, what was it? He was making lemonade and the lemonade was frozen and he couldn't ha figure out how to unfreeze the lemonade. And so, but in the context of that hour, suddenly these messages about water and matter and the properties of matter start to be more relevant because there's many opportunities to try and teach the same thing. So when we're putting our content out there in our broader ecosystem, we are making sure that YouTube has the Don Cheadle clip or that our street.org site has a Super Grover game that helps us teach, um, you know, deepen the learning from the street story. And we're really trying to program a kid's world so that there's some, even in a fractured environment, there's some sort of thinking to how these pieces can, can support one another. 
Um, and we've seen some really exciting evidence out of this strategy. So, um, you know, when we did Elmer the Musical, we at the same time as we broadcast the show, we launched a game online and it was a really great, you know, we did a lot of testing around it and, and some summative testing too. And what we, what, it was such a good reminder to me that different platforms present such different opportunities for learning. And there's things that we can do on the linear show that we can't do elsewhere, but there's things we can do in the digital world that is that deepens the learning in such a powerful way. So we had in Alma the Musical, there was one piece that was all about one-to-one -one correspondence, and, um, and the, we did some pre and post testing. And the, after having played the game, kids were 23% more likely to be able to understand the rationale for one-to-one -one correspondence, which is just such a heartening reminder of the power of different platforms to educate in different ways. Um, and you know, we're also always thinking about what is it that's gonna make this particular piece of content work on the specific platform it's on. And even if we're in the middle of a STEAM curriculum, if Carly Rae Jepsen's going crazy on YouTube, we want to think about how do we jump on the back of whatever's happening there and convert it into something that can teach kids in, in a way that, that's true to who we are. So we launched, just last year, we launched our version of uh, Call Me Maybe. And maybe my, the, the highlight for me in this particular um, uh, experience was I got a call from uh, the head of our kind of social media stuff and he was like Nadine Nadine it's gone viral in the playground and I was like what do you mean what are you talking about and he said look there was I just some mom just phoned me and she said her kid came home singing share it maybe and the mom said to him no 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 darling you've got it wrong it's call it maybe call me maybe it's not share it maybe and he's like no mom Cookie Monster just had his own version and it's shared maybe. And it's like, oh my gosh, we've gone viral in the playground. That's awesome. Me got a wish on me mind. It is the chocolate chip kind. Me look at you and me tell. You may have snicker doodle. Me trade me soul for a bite. Me spell it out black and white. Me look at you and me see you like an elf in a tree. You cookie showing, and me hunger growing. Let's get skim milk flowing. We'll start this snack going, baby. Hey, me just met you, and this is crazy. But you got cookie, so share it, maybe. It's hard to look at your snack, baby. But you got cookie, so share it, maybe. Hey, me just met you. And this is crazy, but you got cookie, so share it, baby. Copy cake for frosting, it no phase me, but you got cookie, so share it, baby. You took your time with the bite, me trying to stay polite. Me start to really freak out, please someone call a Girl Scout. Me no grumble or grouse, this thing is toll on me house. Me going off me rocker, please be me Betty Crocker. You cookie showing and me hunger growing. Let's get skim milk flowing, we'll start this snack going baby. Hey, me just met you, and this is crazy. But you got cookie, we we'll share it maybe. It's hard to look at. You snack baby, but you got cookie, so share it baby. Hey, me just met you, and this is crazy, but you got cookie, so share it maybe. Pie and ice cream, it no phase me, but you got cookie, so share it baby. Before you came into me like me missed you so bad, me missed you so bad. Missed you so so bad before you came into me like me missed you so bad and you should know that me missed you so so bad 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 bad. It hard to look at your snack baby, but you got cookie, so share it maybe. Hey, me just met you. And this is crazy, but you got cookie, so share it maybe. Chocolate pudding, 
It no phase me, but you got cookie, so share it maybe. <gasps> cookie! Um, nom, nom, nom. Um, you guys must, uh, you know, enjoy viral success or be on the wave of them all the time. But for us, it was like this is it was crazy that for every day we were getting a million views and we were like, oh, my gosh, what is happening? This is so great. Um, it was very exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, Dan and I were looking for provocative things to talk about and we were like, what does innovation look like in 10 years? Um, so I thought I'd take a stab. Um, and, you know, I really think innovation so in america you, you can do anything and innovation looks so techy we were just in the middle where you know we're at gdc that's the reason i'm here and part of the things we're demoing there is we worked with qualcomm on this super cool um, way to use the all join technology that lets characters be in the tv and then dive out of the tv into the ipad and we've had this crazy experience with kids testing it that they're like oh my gosh abby's in my ipad and then abby's in the tv and it's so exciting and it was this like really dynamic experience because you can see in the picture that you see that crazy box like it was one of two boxes that they that they had this you know technology on and it was literally like in order to get it to work you had to put a tape dispenser on it and then like hold it and then it wouldn't work i mean and then two weeks later they came back and they turned this huge box into something as big as a, a soap bar and you're like my gosh like innovation is so in our life and in our world and you can just do anything and then just like two weeks later, I got an email from somebody, one of our partners in India, and they had done something truly exceptional for their um, show. You know, th they have a big problem reaching rural populations. And so they had created this rickshaw where they put the TV on the edge of the rickshaw and this rickshaw goes driving through the streets of India and literally hundreds and hundreds of kids will gather in a s public space so that they can watch the show. And it struck me that in it, those two are just equally innovative. They're thinking about the needs of the audience and they're responding to them in the most intuitive way. And it feels to me like one can get sidetracked by technology and okay, that's what innovation is. But so long as you're true to your audience and what they need, you can't really make a bad decision. And and I, you know, I had a personal experience just recently that, I, that I'll leave you with that is the point that I, the moment where I kind of realized the power of being true to what people and children are experiencing in their everyday. Um, it was Hurricane Sandy and just it, it, on, on the East Coast, we were literally all of us immediately on the phone saying, what are we going to do to help respond to this crisis that is going to face children as they start dealing with the implications of Hurricane Sandy? And it was so gratifying for us to be able to do something. We had shot a show with Big Bird, year, like literally in the 80s, where over five different episodes, he had, he, he, the uh, hurricane had come to Sesame Street and had blown away Big Bird's nest. And we were able to take these shows that had been done many, many years ago and edit them together into a one hour piece show that broadcast on air. And making the show was in and of itself this incredible journey because no, no trains were working. You know, we had editors down in Red Hook who were riding on their bikes up to get to the office. One, she got knocked over, ended up in hospital. Like, you know, people just really putting their lives at risk, honestly, so that they could make the show. And it was so, felt so good when we finished the show and we handed it off and we're like, oh, we did a great thing. And then three weeks later, I was going on tours to find a new preschool for my son and I happened on one of these preschools and they had a huge big thing where obviously you know the, the hurricane impacted children's lives and in their preschools the teachers were talking about it and trying to frame it and so the, there was a big sign that says what does Hurricane Sandy mean to me and there were like 10 quotes from their pre this preschool class and of the 10 quotes six of them 
were talking about Big Bird losing his nest. And it was this crazy moment where you're like, wow, we're not just in a little edit suite doing what we're doing. We're changing the way that kids see their world. And that was just so, it, it's such a vital thing to remember that, you know, and you guys have, are in this incredible, incredible, have this opportunity to speak to the world. And I, I could imagine it can get easy to forget that the world is not a globe, but a whole lot of kids in a little preschool class who are thinking about Big Bird losing his nest. Anyway, so that was, that's kind of what I, what I, what I had. Did I whip through that in lightning speed? Fine, we have plenty of time to talk. Thank you. Thank you. So you get to manage questions. You okay, good. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Could you, could you touch on how Sesame Street addressed HIV and AIDS and uh, implications for other childhood diseases like diabetes, perhaps obesity? So, you know, when we were working in South Africa, and that was actually the first year that I joined the Sesame team, I had the privilege of being on the team, the first team to develop the, so wait, maybe let me go back a section. When we were working in South Africa, our curriculum advisors obviously said to us, look, HIV AIDS is a serious, serious need, and we need to address it, and you know, it's relevant to children's lives, and we need a way to address it in South Africa. And um, so we had this curriculum seminar, and I was lucky enough to be in the room as we were talking about what we were gonna do. And it was really interesting, actually, because, you know, you come, I'm just a producer. Like, I'm not an educator, and you're, you're learning. You, I find I'm learning so much every day about how to educate kids. And so all of us sit in the room, and we're like, well, what can we do to try and deal with this? And you kind of get in touch with your own stereotypes or, you know, your own personal issues with dealing with some of these things. And I remember everyone in the room was like, there was some quiet person in the back who said, what about if we made one of our characters HIV positive? And there was this like crazy vibe in the room that everyone was like, oh, oh no, I think that's a bit much. And it was that moment where everyone was like, that's exactly why we have to do it, is that there's, there's no, no other brand, honestly, that's strong enough to do the bold thing that is the right thing to do. But it was that, that real moment of kind of grappling with our own issues in dealing with the disease and you know, our own kind of um, issues with it. Anyway, so out of that, we created Cami, who, was, who is HIV positive. And it's, I mean, it's incredible. She's been invited to join the UN as the spokeswoman for kids. And it's, I really think she's been hugely powerful in, in the HIV AIDS message and being able to speak to kids about how it impacts their lives and, and what that looks like. And I think our feeling, as a, particularly because of the journey we've been through with Cami, is provided you're true to the needs of the, of the community you're working in. And, I, and you know, when we, when we dealt with um, HIV AIDS in South Africa, there was a huge backlash in the US that you know, the, the news went crazy. They're like, what is Sesame Street doing teaching HIV AIDS in, in you know, and uh, our, what are our kids learning on Sesame Street? And somehow they'd missed that we were teaching it in South Africa where it was a chronic need for children. Um, so my feeling is so long as you're true to what the audience in that country needs, we will teach anything if it's what that group of people need. And has Sesame Street considered other healthcare challenges beyond that? We've got quick, quick, could you repeat the question? For oh, yeah. Has Sesame Street um, dealt with any other health issues? Um, so, yes, we have. We're actually working on a big um, uh, uh, water program that's all about diarrhea prevention and healthy kind of water uh, practices. So that's a big one. Um, we haven't gone to diabetes. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. A lot of heart stuff in South America. There's a lot of kind of healthy heart, healthy, healthy um, habits messaging. And you know, in the U.S., we obviously have a huge healthy habits curriculum that's all about exercise and healthy eating. And that's why Cookie Monsters got you know cookies are sometimes food. We we gotta get the apples on the table. <laughs> <laughs> representative were those clips of the research you do because in the clips you had the researcher sitting there with with their their notebooks in front of the kids and that seems like that might 
influence them? I mean, it is true. Oh, oh, how, uh, how, how do we actually do the research we do? Because in the clips, we had researchers actually sitting in the room. You know, we are very hands-on in that way. Like, we do sit with the kids and and moderate that research experience and you know we have so i think the point is we have different kinds of studies <laughs> depending what that what outcome we need so it, it, those are content research studies that you were seeing where we the nuance between understanding what the child got or what didn't get we are going to use that to inform a practical production outcome and that's different to some of the summative research we may do which is much more analytical that's that's where we don't want to get in the middle of you know c complicating the data because we are actually talking with the child so that and many of those studies we actually don't do ourselves we work with another party to actually do those so that they can be objective so um i mean jane kotler would be would be able to speak to it better but i think we we basically we change our research practice depending on what outcome we need and how objective we need to be in the given situation like field studies where you're in their home, their natural environment? We have, we have an, oh, what well, do we ever do field studies? Sorry, sorry, not intuitive. Uh, do we ever do field studies? Yes, we do. And we, I'm forgetting what the name of the study was, we just completed a piece where we were leaving materials in home with families for them to self-report on what the children learned and you know what the parents' impression was of what the children learned from that piece. Folks in San Bruno have a question. Oh, hi, San Bruno. What's your question? What's your question? Can you hear us? Yeah. Great. I'm um, curious as to how you think about uh, digital video and the future of that versus terrestrial video and traditional television. And if you're, if you're thinking that they will continue to kind of act in parallel or they're going to diverge and you're building, are you starting to build more for digital and is terrestrial going to kind of go by the, the wayside or is it, is it going to continue and, and you're just going to build to reach the, the largest audience? How do you think about weighing uh, production and, and the time and resources that you devote to each? Do I have to actually repeat that question? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got it. It's a good one. Uh, so, you know, what we've found, we obviously do a lot of uh, analysis of our audience and where our audience is. And for now, we still see our hugest audience being in terrestrial TV. And I think because so much of our drive is to reach kids who are otherwise ne aren't necessarily connected, I think for my, my feeling is in the... In the, in the foreseeable future, terrestrial TV will be a driver for what we need to do. But I think we're really excited by the potential that different platforms have. And, you know, certainly it's not that we are not thinking about it. It's that we are, we are thinking about it and making choices according to how our audience shifts in a given year. And, and we are definitely... You know, we just launched, a, or not just a year ago, maybe launched a project with with Microsoft with the Connect Sesame Street TV, which was basically taking the linear show and making it interactive. And I think we're always looking for what is the next idea that takes our the foundation of our linear experience and extends it digitally in an interesting way. But whether whether or not any of those things are going to be sea changes for us, I don't think we are we are there yet. Given that you guys have such an emphasis on testing, both I guess what you call summative after the fact, and you know, you're in the you observe people watching the show. If we went back and watched a, a Sesame Street episode from 10, 20 years ago, would we be able to see how? like pedagogical improvements have been made over like the medium term? Are there like big sea changes in, in you know, best practices in teaching the kids that would be, you know, evident really quicker? I think so. And actually so much so that, you know, we, our educators now, 
have kind of termed it because we need to be able to d help the audience differentiate by the things that were made within a different educational framework and the things that are made in a modern one. And so we've started using this definition of classic as a way to try and help the audience understand because there's some crazy stuff that that used to be okay. I mean, there was, I, I actually think we even have some clips where people are smoking. Like, you know, they're, 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 it, it was a different world and, we, and that content then was re resonating with that particular context. So, you know, like we have whole volumes of content, old school one, old school two, that's all classic content that if we put that through the lens that we now use to educate, I don't think we'd be comfortable. First. It's a little fuzzy, honestly. Um, I think it's somewhere mid 80s, but Rosemary would be able to. I think, like, once you get into that mid zone, it's kind of case by case. <laughs> what do you think? Or do you guys think about atypical learners, like learners like that are watching Sesame Street, for instance, not in their native language? They might be ahead on the concepts, but slower on the language. Do you, do you concern yourself with that, that category? Do we consider our, um, the atypical learners when we're producing the content we're working with? You know, I think when, when you're producing for a two-year-old, a lot of those decisions get made for you because you have to simplify it so much in order to resonate with that two-year-old that many of the times we're, we're making it available to atypical learners, not because we're intentionally trying to, but because by making it work for a two-year-old, many atypical learners will be able to learn with it. And I think it's one of the reasons why adults feel like they can learn English from the show or, you know, like w there, there are many communities that I think resonate with our content specifically. We get incredible emails from parents of kids who have autism who just seem to connect with the characters in this very apparent way. So I think the power of the two-year-old is that you kind of get to reach a whole broad audience. Can I extend that question slightly because I'm wondering how you characterize, you think about the, your audience it's two-year-olds, but two-year-olds are very different than four-year-olds. And so how do you, when you're doing your production design, hit such a broad audience? In some ways, that's broader than, I mean, the cognitive differences are very different between those different groups, especially when you try to think about, say, U.S. versus Canada versus, say, New Zealand and South Africa. Yeah. Um, so the question is, how do we <laughs> deal with the relative developmental differences between a two-year-old and a six-year-old. And it's really interesting, actually. So we went through a phase where we saw how many two-year-olds were with the sh content of our show, and we very intentionally built content that would work for them. And I think Alma's World came out of that phase where we were really simplifying the messages. It's like Alma's World balls, Alma's World, you know, mouth, like very simple concepts. And what we found was we were losing some of that older audience. So we very intentionally worked on developing content that would skew to the older. And I think what we found is we can do that and still be, stay re relevant to the two-year-olds. Whereas we can't develop for two-year-olds and stay relevant to four, but we can develop for four and still be relevant to two. And one of the, th so, so that's been one of the shifts we've been moving through. But very recently, actually, we were, we've, uh, it's interesting you raise it because we felt we needed to just be much clearer about where our audience was on the specific goals we were teaching, de depending on the developmental phase. So we've been working on this really incredible framework that maps out, like, it, if you're teaching, you know, conflict resolution to a two-year-old that looks like this, to a three-year-old that looks like this, to a four-year-old that looks like that. And, and we're not using it as a tool to say, okay, now I need an idea for the two, an idea for the three, or an idea for the four, but we're using it so that we have a sense of the, the larger needs of the audience, knowing that there'll be some things that work particularly well for one audience and something. And I do think that's one of the opportunities of a magazine show, is that you get to do a lot of things in that hour. So what, the reason I'm asking, um, my last question, <laughs> is that 
Uh, some of the stuff Sesame Street has done has done a fantastic job about introducing incredibly sophisticated concepts at a very low age. Mm. So my best example there is the is the uh, Schoolhouse Rock. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 it's I think it's the song. There's a song that introduces the notion of dollar cost averaging, which most adults don't understand. But I've seen ten year olds talk about dollar cost averaging within In the their song. It's it, just yeah. astonishing, right? It's crazy. So uh, I was just wondering if you. Especially with the STEM stuff, if you try to think how to communicate that down in, in the, the grade levels. Well, I, I mean, it was Joey referenced it there. Like, so, you know, we're entertainers. So we, like, find ourselves having to learn in order to know what we need to teach, which is truly fascinating and, you know, a real challenge. Um, your question is, sorry, I lost you. <laughs> how do you take, for example, the STEM stuff and design it for the six-year-olds? But also make it work for younger oh, grades. I think this That's is where word. this is uh, this is where our educators are really, really helpful. Is when we tackle a very complex educational goal, they don't give us the complex paper that has the complex educational goal. They say, "This is what this looks like for our audience." So when we start content production, we're working at a much more contained level. You know, we really. Are, are much, it's much more accessible. And I think that's a good way to get at it. What about, do you think, um, about differences between long form and short term content? Like, I know that you do a lot of smaller clips within a longer show. Do you try and focus certain concepts to shorter lengths of time? Or are you typically doing a theme or course? You know, the, this, uh, uh, how do we feel about uh, different lengths of content, short form versus long form? So our longest form content is probably those street stories, which are like 12 minutes long. And we really are excited by that chunk of time because it not only lets you get at uh, an educational goal in a robust way, but there's real emotional journeys through it. Like you, your characters get to, you know, they have highs, they have lows, which in a five minute clip, it's very one dimensional. Um, so I personally, as a content producer, not necessarily with my kind of distribution hat on because that short form content is so powerful and is so portable and, you know, there's so much about it that's vital and valuable. but when you're trying to connect with or with your audience and make a emotional connection i do think that longer form gives you more scope so i want to know with with specific topics do you say that like this is too complex for a short clip or or do you worry about uh things getting too complex as they get longer you know uh, the question is do we worry about things do we consider that when dealing with the complexity of the message we teach in specific clips you know one of the things that's been eye-opening to me I've been the supervising producer on the show for two years now and one of the things that's just like it's actually such a relief is we have such incredible creative writers that honestly if you got a good idea and it's a 12 minute idea, it's going to be a 12 minute idea. And if you've got a good idea and it's a two minute idea, then it's going to be a two minute idea. And there's something about that that's really affirming because it's not like, hey, creative genius, make your genius work in 30 seconds. It's like, come up with the idea. And if it's a good idea, we'll find a place for it. And I think that is maybe one of the things that's helpful about our magazine format is we can kind of roll with that in a way that's liberating. Any other questions? How do you assess the needs of various like cultures and countries or groups of people within a country and stuff like that? So that, that model of a curriculum seminar, we replicate, oh, how do we deal with the differing needs, like understanding the differing needs of different, the different countries we work in? Um, so we have, the first thing we do before we start a co-production in a new country is do what this kind of assessment of need phase, which is even before we get to the curriculum seminar, which is us mapping out like what are the specific needs of kids in that country? and 
can media help us address those specific needs? And those are like white papers that are looking at the media landscape, looking at the specific health needs of a country, the specific social emotional needs. You know, we kind of bucket it into big, broad um, educational curriculum areas. And then out of that, assuming out of that, we're like, yes, there is a need in this country and we believe media can help answer that need. Not many times we don't think we can, but um, then we have the curriculum seminar and those curriculum seminars are honestly maybe my favorite part of the work we do internationally. Like in India, we, I remember sitting at this table where like, there are people who had shaped the national curriculum sitting at the table telling you what it is kids in India need to be learning. And you're like, and you know, in India, like, whatever idea you can think of, somebody's written three doctorate papers on. It's like, these are the, the top of their field. And I, w I, f I would find myself sitting there thinking, what on earth am I doing at this table? This is crazy. These people are brilliant. They know the needs of the, the, the country, their country. And it's, there's something really comforting about that, that it's not on us. <coughs> Our job is to just create an environment that the people who really know what is right for the, the kids in that country are able to share. So we're gonna have to stop there, but um Nadine will be around for lunch. For anybody who is here, uh, welcome to come with us. We're just going over to Big Table. For people in San Bruno, she'll be there in a couple hours. So she'll be there. But join me in thanking our speaker once again. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you.